Those of you who are new to the drill, don't worry, the camera's not on you. So, you know, you can pick your nose, blow your nose, do whatever you like. <laughs> I have to be a little more careful. Um, but anyway, please don't be nervous. Pretend like the camera's not there. Um, I know it's hard, but you'll get used to it. Um, all right, some of you already know the drill, if you had me last term. But so I think I left off last week roughly at sort of the end of 1916. Um, I mentioned that 1916 was the year of some terrible battles on the Western Front, the most notorious of them being Verdun and the Somme. Now these battles, again, they were not so much significant for what happened in terms of uh, any loss or gains in strategic terms, that is, of territory. They were more significant simply because of the colossal waste of material and, of course, men and their lives. Um, one was a German offensive, one was an Allied offensive, both were equally futile and destructive of human life. Verdun, in fact, the entire town of Verdun has basically been turned into a war museum. It's extraordinary if you go there. They have a whole underground, almost like a tunnel, devoted to uh, basically everything from life on the home front to life in the trenches to what the battles were like. They even have this fantastic sort of sound effect, the sound of an incoming shell. You know, what it sounded like if you were in a dugout and enemy shells were arriving. This kind of high-pitched scream that would just terrify you. Um, there were experiments and other kinds of weapons, poison gas, which I talked about. The tank was just beginning to be kind of experimentally developed at this point. Uh, the British were the first, actually, to master it, and then the Germans. But the tank was not really effective until the last year of the war. In part because the internal combustion engine just was not strong enough yet to produce the necessary thrust. But the tank really was born of the Western Front, literally. Because there was no other way of breaking through the enemy lines, of breaking through the barbed wire, breaking through the machine gun fire that I talked about. The futility, the waste, the ultimate war of attrition just leading nowhere, all of this led eventually to the collapse of morale to a certain extent on the Western Front. Um, immediately, in immediate terms, in both France and Britain, you had a kind of change in governments. Again, the internal politics are less important than simply the fact that whatever government was in power was now discredited. Um, not that the emerging governments were pacifist, of course not. They were more extreme, though. Lloyd George, um, it was a so-called unionist government, meaning that it brought together different parties, but he was far less of a traditional figure in the Tory, that is, or the Conservative Party. Um, there, there were Labour representatives, Conservative representatives. Basically, the new government was just devoted to winning the war at all costs. The same thing in France, where the old tiger, the radical politician Clemenceau, emerged, mainly because he had a reputation as being an uncompromising hater of the Germans, more or less. So you get kind of a push to the extremes. The governments fall, they're replaced by even more extreme governments. Morale in the trenches, though, is actually beginning to slip. Uh, the so-called Chemin des Dames offensive, this was in uh, April to May of 1917. You had the first pseudo-mutinies on the Western Front, which is to say, it's not that the men necessarily killed their officers. It's that they began refusing to go again on the suicidal offensive into the barbed wire, into the machine gun fire. This was a French mutiny, not a British one. So morale is just beginning to crack a little bit on the Allied side. Uh, 1916 was a particularly difficult year for the Allies. They lost more men than the Germans. Their offensive seemed even more futile if that was possible. But basically you have this kind of almost feeling in the air that something has to change. The men cannot go on as they are going. What was going to change? Now, oddly enough, there was a great deal of hope for the Russians. The Russians, remember, being part of this alliance, initially in the war they had not done well against the Germans. 1915, if you remember, the Russians had essentially lost Poland. It was the so-called Great Retreat 
Russia lost her forward position in Austrian Galicia. She lost all of what is now Poland. The retreat basically pushed up towards the Baltic coast. Eventually it petered out, as I said, like all offensives did. In Turkey, of course, the Russians were doing much better. I talked about this. They were in Rize, Trabzon, they were perched in Erzincan, Bitlis, they'd already taken Van and the whole Van Lake region area. In Persia, they had pretty much taken over the northern part of the country. It had already been a zone of influence before the war, but now the Russians had fanned out and really occupied the place with a serious expeditionary force under a guy called General Baratov. The Russians thus were poised to march into Mesopotamia, possibly on Baghdad, although it looked more like that was the British objective coming up the Tigris River from Basra. The Russians had as their primary objective Mosul. Uh, essentially, the um, so-called Kurdish areas of northern Iraq were expected to fall into the Russian sphere as the Russians were pushing on, that is, into Anatolia from the east. Ankara looked like it was poised to fall. They made it to Ankara. They could have simply hopped on a train and then made their way to Istanbul, Constantinople. This is, in fact, what people were expecting. Now, oddly enough, in the first year or so of the war, when Russia was kind of losing badly to the Germans, they had come up with all of these excuses. They said, we didn't have enough shell. Shell being, again, what is being fired from the guns, artillery. Uh, not bullets, you know, these are like the large balls that are being fired by artillery. More accurate than they used to be. You know, now they're actually pointed. It's not just like the old stone cannonballs. Shell was extremely important. You know, it had to be manufactured to very precise specifications. The Russians claim we didn't have enough. Now, it's the kind of thing military historians like to argue about. Was it really a material thing, or was this kind of an excuse for why they performed so badly on the battlefield? Anyway, the upshot of this is that by the end of 1916, Russian production of shell had been ramped up dramatically. The Russians now had something like a two-to-one advantage on the Eastern Front that is over the Germans and Austrians in terms of firepower, striking power. In purely material terms, that is, the Russians should have been poised to win in 1917. In fact, they had a conference. They had several conferences that winter. You know, as always in winter, there's kind of a lull in the fighting because of the cold weather and so on. Everyone hunkers down for the winter. The Allies got together at Chantilly in France. They also met in Petrograd. And the Russians were, as the word had it, full of fight. That is, they were ready to win. The Russians thought they were about to beat Turkey, and they even thought they finally had the force in place to defeat the Germans. In 1916, it's not that Russia had done that well, but uh, under a general called Brusilov, they had made the first breakthroughs, that is, through trenches. They were tactical, that is, they did not lead to strategic gains of any large sense. They were largely in this region called Galicia, that is between what is now Poland and essentially Austria, the kind of area then that is on the border between Russia and Austria, um, an area which is part Polish, part Ruthenian, Ukrainian. This is where most of the fighting between Russia and Austria took place. The Russians made a series of breakthroughs. Uh, Rusilov's conception, his kind of innovation was that the attacks needed to be made in several places at once so that the Allies were not able to bring up reinforcements. He pierced through, that is, the Austrian and even some of the German lines in numerous places, allowing his men to hold their breakthroughs, to hold on to the new ground that they gained because reinforcements were not able to be brought up quickly enough. Now, that said, they were tactical. They gained, again, a matter of miles, kilometers. They did not break the morale of the Austrian and the German armies. They did not encircle large numbers of troops. That said, again, they were ready by 1917. With a roughly two to one advantage in artillery and shell and firepower, the Russians were poised for a victory. So that in a curious way, if you had simply been a kind of neutral observer of the scene in early 1917, you would have thought the real problem was in France and Britain, where the governments are about to fall where morale is slipping in the armies, where the Western Front is just this charnel house of carnage. Russia was where the hope was. Russia is where everyone expected there would be a breakthrough. 
not least because of the situation in Germany. Now, this was largely to do with the blockade. The British, of course, controlled the seas. Now, curiously, the Germans had built, if you remember from last term, the Weltpolitik of the Kaiser. There was a kind of naval race with Britain. Curiously, they had built a deep water navy of dreadnought class battleships. And curiously enough, it was built in northern Germany, that is in the North Sea, in the Baltic, facing the British Navy, which, however, was superior. So basically, the German Navy spent most of the war in port doing nothing. Useless, essentially. It was a vast waste of German resources before the war. They were not able to break out of the British naval screen. They were not able to break the blockade. They were not able to supply any of their clients or allies by sea. Turkey, of course, was supplied over land. Uh, after Serbia was knocked out of the war by railway, until then they had to use kind of like river boats, barges, along with railway. The British, however, controlled the seas, which meant they could throttle Germany's economy by blockading it. Now, this had been something Britain, of course, had traditionally done. They had done it against Napoleon. You remember Napoleon had uh, responded with his so-called continental system, trying to ban everyone from trading with Britain. Um, the British, in some ways, were even more successful in the First World War in blockading Germany. In fact, in both of the World Wars, the Germans would be forced to make all kinds of improvisations because they were cut off from world commerce. Um, Turkey's significance in the Second World War as a neutral power was mostly to do with metals like chrome, um, which the Germans needed. Um, the Germans famously even eventually had to figure out in the Second World War how to manufacture liquid petroleum, that is oil, from coal, because they were not able to import it. Now, in the First World War, oil was not yet as important as it would be later. However, food was. Germany, it's not that the Germans starved necessarily but they were not able to import foodstuffs from America, not in any significant quantities. So they were short of things like grain and corn. Now, oddly enough, they still had a lot of vegetables, <laughs> and that's not so bad, after all. In fact, there are interesting scenes of um, kind of British agents and spies who went into Germany during the war, and they said, my God, you can't get bread anywhere, but the vegetables are fresh. And in the luxury hotels, they had meat, better than you could have in Britain. On the other hand, again, they had no grain. Now, this was significant. Significant because, of course, grain is the most efficient way of getting calories and so on. They had to ration food. Some of it, in fact, e economists like to argue about whether it was really the fault of the blockade or whether it had to do with the government price controls. Whoever was to blame, the fact was that by the winter of, again, 1916 to 17, people were really suffering in Germany. Now, this was important, again, whatever the origins of the fact, the fact itself assumed significance because it was political. You could blame it on the British, obviously, the blockade, and that's what, of course, the propaganda, the press did. There was also an element of kind of almost um, desire for revenge because, after all, if the British were to blame for poor Germans not having enough to eat, then maybe they should get some of their own medicine. And so the Germans started talking about ways of getting back at the British, also potentially ending the war more quickly by forcing the British to suffer just as the Germans were. Now this leads eventually to the resumption of what is called unrestricted submarine warfare. Now if you know a little bit about military history, you know that in both of the world wars, again in part because British, the British surface navy was superior to Germany's, Britain controlled the seas, and the German response to this was largely to send out the U-boats. Um, now, they were not submarines in the modern sense, where we talk about a nuclear-powered submarine, which because of its core reactor can stay underwater literally for weeks, if not months, on end. These were kind of sort of submarines. They would dive in order to attack, but then the rest of the time they had to stay above water. So they were somewhat vulnerable. However, they were still fairly new, and so defenses against them had not really been developed yet. In fact, they took 
think his name was Rutherford, they took a British scientist and they actually held him upside down underwater <laughs> in order to try to figure out ways of testing essentially like sonar depth charges. And eventually they did invent a kind of primitive way of testing the water for the vibrations produced by a submarine. This was really not worked out, though, until near the end of the war, and even then not terribly effectively. So the submarines were effective. Now, the thing about them which was controversial was, of course, this. While a submarine knocking out a battleship was not necessarily objectionable on kind of laws of war grounds. After all, they were both warships. Submarines could also attack civilian ships. That is, they could attack the ships which were feeding Britain. Now, part of the legacy of not only British industrialization, which we talked about last term, but the notion of free trade and laissez-faire, was that Britain had been the pioneer in essentially globalizing its own economy, such that Britain no longer grew anywhere near the amount of food that it needed to feed its population. Britain defended profoundly, in percentage terms, something like half or more, that is, of its food came in from outside the country. So Britain was highly dependent on food imports, highly dependent on merchant ships bringing things like grain and cotton and beef from the Americas particularly. And so the German submarine warfare, particularly after the resumption in 1917 of unrestricted submarine warfare, literally targeted these food ships. Not just food ships, but those were in a way the most important. In a way, again, that was the point, to make the British suffer, to starve the British just as the Germans were starving. Now, it was a risky policy for a number of reasons. Um, back in 1915, there had been a number of incidents, the most famous of which was the sinking of the Lusitania, which was a large passenger line. You know, think like Titanic, basically. Um, mostly civilians. The numbers of dead are somewhere around 1,200 something, like 1,200 dead, most of them civilians, many, though not all of them, Americans. America, remember, was still neutral. So that this incident became a scandal, a kind of cause celebre, which in fact forced the Germans back then to reconsider their submarine policy. So that if they came upon ships they suspected of possibly carrying arms or something to Britain, then they would at least give due notice before they blew it out of the water. They would also try to avoid, that is, attacking purely civilian ships, those carrying food and so on, because the Americans objected. Now, for the Americans, the freedom of the seas was a cardinal principle of their foreign policy, going back to the earliest days of the Republic. In fact, if you remember, the very first pseudo-great power war America ever fought was actually against Great Britain. That was back in 1812, the War of 1812, as it's called, although it lasted until 1814. And that war was fought in part because of the British policy of blockading Europe. That is, America felt it needed the right to trade. That was a cardinal part of American foreign policy. So that the Germans, in this sense, the British, here's the thing, they were both violating the principle. The Germans by literally sinking civilian ships, and the British, of course, by blockading Europe. In fact, in some ways, this is why America was able to stay neutral, at least on principle, for as long as it was. It had a case against both of the coalitions. The British were blockading and preventing the Americans from trading with Europe, at least you know, on a large scale. The Germans, meanwhile, were actually literally destroying merchant ships and, and killing civilians. The Germans realized how dangerous that was. Back when the Lusitania sank and it caused this big scandal, they actually did begin to restrict their policies. So what they were doing in 1917, when they went back to unrestricted submarine warfare, that is, literally without restrictions. They knew, in fact, that this would annoy, anger the Americans, that it might possibly bring America into the war. I mean, they argued about this. Uh, the men in the Navy who were behind the policy, they argued in terms of merchant tonnage. They said, well, look, we're going to sink so many tons of shipping that Britain will starve by May, and so the British will just have to basically leave the war and the war will be over before the Americans can even react.
Now, it's true, the Americans would have taken a long time to mobilize an army. In fact, America, despite being now the largest economy in the world, its army was smaller than Bulgaria's had been even before Bulgaria entered the war. America didn't really have an army. It had an army of about 20,000 men. Um, it reminds me, actually, Bismarck uh, had a famous comment about the British army, that is, before World War I, you know, where he said, well, let them send the British army to Europe. I shall send the police of Berlin to arrest them. That is, they were that small. America's army was even smaller. It was about 20,000 men. So the Germans thought, well, look, it's a little bit like, it's a little dangerous. You know, it's like you're at the zoo, you know, and you want to pet the tiger, right? It's kind of like, ooh, nice tiger. Please don't attack me. Please don't attack me. And then you decide maybe you're going to provoke the tiger. You want to make sure that you're far enough away before you do that. So the Germans thought, look, America's on the other side of the ocean. They'll probably get angry, but they won't be able to do much about it, at least not for the next six months or so. That was the argument they made. The civilian politicians, particularly Bethmann Holweg, the chancellor, objected to this. He said it's crazy, you know, suicidal strategically, to bring America into the war. Shades, of course, of Japan and Pearl Harbor, 1941. Ah, but they're far away the general said. Well, Bethmann Holweg lost. And in fact, in the course of losing this argument, in a way, he kind of lost his authority. And eventually this led to first him being a puppet chancellor and then him resigning and being replaced. Germany, from about this time forward, more or less has a military government. It's not quite a dictatorship in the sense of like Hitler in the Second World War, but it's close to that. You know, the army is now controlling more and more of the country and the economy directly. The figure usually associated with this is Erich Ludendorff. You remember the victor from the famous Battle of Tannenberg. So the generals begin to take over. The victory over this policy is essentially a victory over the civilians and the diplomats saying, look, the military is going to decide things on their own. But again, these people were not stupid. They may have been crazy, they may have been suicidal, but they weren't stupid. They knew that America would almost certainly react to this, that it would have to react to this. When you had reports coming in of, again, civilian vessels being sunk, you know, dead Americans. I mean, you can't ignore that. It's like an act of war. So the Germans knew there was a very good chance that America might have to enter the war. And so then they did their next suicidal maneuver. This one was even dumber. Arthur Zimmermann. Uh, former Under Secretary of State, now Secretary of State, the equivalent of Foreign Minister. Now, he and his staff put together an offer, an offer from Mexico. <laughs> ah, Mexico. You may remember that term from last term, the Reconquista. That is when the Spanish took Spain back over and expelled the Moors and, you know, also uh, many Jews, obviously, to the Ottoman Empire. Well, actually, you hear this term these days with the demographic influx of Mexicans and illegal aliens into places like Arizona, California, New Mexico. Well, the Reconquista, the reason it was a powerful idea, potentially, is that California, Arizona, and New Mexico had actually been part of Mexico until pretty late in the game. The Mexican-American War uh, fought from 1846 to 1848. This and then a couple of treaties signed up to about 1853. This was not that long ago at this time. It was only about 70 years previously that America, that is the United States, had wrested control of the Southwest from Mexico, including, of course, California, with all of the significance that it represents. In fact, the, the Mexicans, part of the reason they got so angry about it was that the Americans had just won this territory in 1848, and then 1849 was when they discovered gold in California, the gold rush. So the Americans had had, shall we say, pretty good timing. Um, so Mexico had never forgiven the Americans for this. Really, up to the current day, if you ever get a Mexican politician, you know, talking over Corona in the cantina, probably lets you know they still view these states as Mexican territory. So the idea of the Reconquista was powerful. The Germans knew this, and they thought, well, we know we're going to piss off the Americans, they might declare war on us, but they're really far away, and maybe we could kind of distract them by unleashing a war with Mexico, that is, between the Americans and Mexico. Now, Mexico at the time was in the middle of this kind of almost civil war meltdown. 
this kind of uh, Robin Hood type character called Pancho Villa was going around the country, you know, rustling up the natives. The Americans were getting involved in the usual sort of blundering way. So the idea had potential. So what the Germans did is they said, look, if you can tie down American forces to delay America's mobilization, we will promise you California, New Mexico, and Arizona. They then put this into wording in a telegram, and they sent this telegram through the U.S. Embassy cable <laughs> using an American um, cipher. I think I wrote that here. Right. They actually used an American cipher um, to send this through the U.S. Embassy diplomatic cable. Now, it was encrypted. Actually, I think I have to show No, they used, it, they used their own cipher, but they used the American cable. So they sent it through the American cable. Obviously, it was encrypted. They didn't think the Americans would read it. I should probably cross that out. It was not a U.S. Embassy cipher, but it was a cable. The cipher was actually one that, unbeknownst to the Germans, the British were able to crack. And this is partly because there are a number of different versions of this story. One of them actually involves this German agent called Wilhelm Vasmus, who was active in southern Persia, uh, basically stirring up this tribe called the Bakhtiaris against the British. Um, now, it's true that the British captured him and they stole his code book. Uh, however, it was not the same code. Uh, they did use this code book, however, to help them decipher some of the other German codes. This is actually a, a not that well appreciated aspect of both of the world wars. Although the Germans rightly are admired for both their military and technical efficiency, the British had the code breakers. British cryptography was lights out. It was absolutely brilliant in both of the world wars. There's a whole movie about it in the Second World War, which we sometimes actually watch in this class, called Enigma, about Bletchley Park. Now, the British were able, that is, to read not everything the Germans sent, but they were able to break enough of the code so that they could intercept some German encrypted traffic. They encrypted, they decrypted, that is, this cable, the Zimmermann Telegram, which was sent to Mexico City, by way of the U.S. Embassy in Berlin and Washington. <laughs> they now developed a problem. The British now knew that Germany had just promised California, New Mexico, Arizona to Mexico. But they knew this because they had broken a German code and because they were reading U.S. diplomatic cables. <laughs> they didn't want to let the Americans know that they were reading American diplomatic cables that they were spying on the Americans too. We tend to think today of the whole British-American special relationship as a kind of inevitable consequence, right? I mean, America was a colony, they both speak English. That definitely was not true the first century and a half of American independence. Britain was the great enemy for most of the 19th century. Now, it's true that in practice, after the War of 1812, this didn't mean they actually fought, but it did mean that most U.S. military planning, including naval planning, actually was directed against Great Britain until the very early 20th century. There was no love lost between them, not a great amount of trust. There was certainly a lot of kind of shared sentiment simply because of commerce and trade and diplomats and, and the common language. But in strategic terms, there was a lot of mistrust. And the British, the last thing they wanted the Americans to know was that they were reading America's diplomatic cable traffic, which would almost certainly make it impossible that America would join the British side in the war. So what the British did, they decrypted the telegraph, and then they sent a new version of it, basically in a cable that they knew the Americans were reading, so that the Americans would intercept it and think that they had figured it out for themselves. This, by the way, is basic human psychology. It can be very useful in something like um, a marriage. <laughs> if you want to convince someone, you can try to make an argument, but it's usually better if they think they have convinced themselves. That is, if they come to their own conclusion based on their own information, it's always better than when you try to convince them by force. And that's what the British did. They basically tricked the Americans into thinking that they had broken a German cable, and thus this scandal actually came from American intelligence instead of from British intelligence. Now, obviously, this causes a big scandal. Germany has just essentially offered to dismember the United States for the benefit of Mexico. Really, one of the stupidest diplomatic blunders of all time. 
because despite a lot of resentment of the German sinking of vessels and so on, there was a rather significant pro-German group in American politics. In fact, Woodrow Wilson, I'll talk more about him in a moment. Woodrow Wilson, the president, now he was a little bit like Bill Clinton would later be. He was a minority president, which is to say he did not get 50% of the vote. When he was elected in 1912, it was because of a split decision, because the Republicans essentially were fielding two candidates. So he was not a very strong president politically. Now, in his coalition, he strengthened it somewhat in 1916 when he ran for re-election. But an important part of his coalition was the upper Midwest. Now, particularly the state of Wisconsin. Well, I, like if you know anything about American popular football culture, it's known for its bratwurst, basically because it's Germanic. Because the whole upper Midwest in America is home to either Germans or people of German descent. In fact, at this time, there are about 5 million Germans and those of immediate German descent in America. So there was a lot of pro-German sentiment. It was not as if it was predestined that America was going to join the war on the other side. Wilson, in fact, had expressly run for re-election in 1916 on the platform of, I kept us out of the war, and I will keep you out of the war. That was the promise. Now, campaign promises are not always kept, but this one was significant. So, we have a lot of pro-German sentiment. We have a president who has publicly avowed to keep America out of the war, in part because he needs German votes, or at least his party does, the Democrats do. Now, you throw this all together. If the Zimmermann telegram had not broken, if the scandal had not broken, there is very little chance that America would have entered the First World War. It would have been very difficult politically. This is something to remember in the Second World War as well. You all know about Pearl Harbor, I'm sure, the basic story. Japanese sneak attack on the American naval base of Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. What not everyone knows about this is that while this obviously brought America into the war against Japan, there was no necessary reason for America to declare war on Germany too in 1941. And in fact, America did not declare war on Germany. Hitler declared war on the Americans, which was incredibly stupid. <laughs> that was almost as stupid, if not more stupid, than the Zimmermann telegram. Because, yet again, there was a lot of pro-German sentiment in America, and it would have been very difficult for FDR in 1914 to tell everyone, look, the Japanese just attacked us, and so we need to go to war with Germany. Didn't really make a lot of sense if you kind of thought about it. Yeah, they were sort of allies, the Japanese and the Germans, but they weren't really working together or anything. I mean, they're in different hemispheres, for Christ's sakes. So, again, the Zimmermann telegram was the greatest possible gift to anyone in America who wanted to enter the war. Even so, several months passed before America finally declared war on Germany. All through February and March, as the German submarine campaign is kind of building to a crescendo, one ship after another is sunk, public opinion is starting to move in the direction of belligerence, but it's still not going all the way. Finally, at the end of March, a couple of huge civilian ships go down, you know, with hundreds and thousands of casualties, including American civilians, again, dead, basically, acts of war. And finally, Wilson decides he has to act. On the 2nd of April, 1917, the U.S. declared war on Germany. Not on Austria-Hungary, not on Turkey, in fact, this is, it's one of those facts which you probably know if you really think about it, but you don't always really emphasize it. I mean, we think about the First World War here in Turkey, and obviously everyone remembers the British and the French, and to some extent the Russians, and there's still a kind of almost lingering anti-English sentiment here that I've seen from time to time because of this. But although more recently there's anti-American sentiment because of, let's say, the Iraq War, there's nothing related to the First World War. Because, in fact, the U.S. never went to war with Turkey. The U.S. declared war on Germany. In fact, the U.S. said we're not really an ally of the other countries. They called themselves a quote-unquote associated power. That is, we'll kind of sort of help you, but we don't really approve of what you're doing. They didn't really approve of British and French diplomacy and war aims and all the rest of it. In fact, I'll talk more about Wilson and his ideas in the second half of the lecture, and again on Friday, because he's such a fascinating character. But basically, America went to war 
with no avowed war aims. That is to say, America was not aiming to conquer territory or adjust borders. America went to war essentially for an abstraction. Uh, the phrase you usually hear is a war to make the world safe for democracy. Oh boy, that sounds familiar. Um, there were other principles which would later emerge, uh, principles to do with uh, self-determination, that is, ethnic groups needing to rule themselves and so on. But most of that was not really formulated until later. Wilson even tried to claim that America was not at war with the German people, whatever exactly that meant. That is, the war was blamed on the Kaiser and kind of a small clique of advisors. So, America went to war, kind of. America began mobilizing an army, but interestingly, just as the Germans had suspected, it took them a really long time to do so. Uh, in both world wars, America went from a point of almost zero up to, of course, a massive army. Now, by 1918, the Americans have an army of four million men in the field in Europe. A year ago, they'd had an army of 20,000. So you're talking about a factor of, well, basically multiplying the size of the army by a factor of about 20,000. <laughs> From 20,000 to 4 million. That's a pretty large increase in the size of an army that happens very, very quickly. Now, the Germans, again, not only did they think the Americans would be slow, but they kind of thought, well, it's not really a military country. I mean, Hitler thought this, too, in the Second World War. Another mistake. But the idea was, look, they're not battle-hardened. You know, they don't even have any generals who have fought in wars. America had fought in a war against Spain in 1898, but Spain was like an also-ran. It wasn't really a very serious war. So the Germans thought, look, you know, by the time America gets its act together, we will have won. Now, interestingly, they weren't necessarily that far off the mark. Because simultaneously, virtually, to this drama with the Zimmermann telegram and unrestricted submarine warfare, another major world event happened. In the course of, again, several weeks, this colossal world-altering consequence of two decisions. The German decision to do this, bringing America into war, and then, of course, the Russian Revolution so-called February Revolution. Now, this is very confusing because, according to our calendar, it actually happened it was the 7th and 8th of March. Uh, 7th and 8th of March. Or actually, no, it was the 8th. The 8th is the key day because, as some of you know, that's International Women's Day, <laughs> which was a creation of the Second Socialist International. Um, and it was, in fact, on Women's Day that the real events started, particularly with a lot of women waiting in bread lines and so on in Petrograd. Now, there was a connection between these events. It's not a direct connection at first glance. America and Russia, after all, are very, very far away from one another. The connection, though, was a legitimate one in a particular office of the German Foreign Ministry. I call it a sabotage bureau. Now, that is not a literal translation. The German actually went something like this. It was the, um, the Bureau für... Uh, Unternehmungen und Aufwiegelungen gegen unsere Feinde. Basically, ways of destroying our enemies from within. They had a phrase for it. They called it um, uh, Revolutionierungspolitik. That is, the politics of revolutions. Now, it's not like it was a new idea. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. If you're fighting a war against this country, you try to weaken them. You know, the French let's say, in the Napoleonic period, had worked with the Irish against the English. It's an old concept. It's an old idea. In this case, though, the Germans had taken it, I think, to another level. Um, I may have mentioned a few of these elements already, but it's really astonishing when you put the whole picture together, kind of how brilliant but also cracked the Germans really were. Way back in 1914, the Germans had produced a memo saying, we are going to undertake revolutionary activities in the, quote, Islamic Israelite world. That is, among Muslims and Jews. By which they meant they would unleash the power of global Muslim opinion to destroy the British Empire because of all of the Muslim subjects of Britain and India, Egypt, and the Gulf states, to a lesser extent, France and North Africa. And meanwhile, they would unleash Zionism to destroy Russia. Zionism, despite its association historically with Britain and the Balfour Declaration of 1917, Zionism was actually originally very much a German and German-Austrian idea. And in fact, nearly all leading Zionists in 1914 
were German or German speaking. The headquarters of the international Zionist executive was in Berlin. Again, which seems ironic in light of what we know about World War II and the Nazis. But at the time, it made a lot of sense. Russia was the homeland of anti-Semitism. Russia is where the protocols of the elders of Zion were first published. A forgery concocted by the Tsarist secret police uh, purporting to prove, again, the Jewish world conspiracy and so on. You know, a document which still sells, shall we say, briskly around the world, particularly in the Arab Middle East today. A kind of conspiracy theory about the global Zionist Jewish uh, conspiracy to control the world through banks and so on. Well, interestingly then, because Russia had been so anti-Semitic, such a symbol of reaction with pogroms, as they were called, where, you know, Jews would be attacked, usually with the connivance of the police. Because of this, many Jews had left Russia. In fact, there were three great emigrations in the late Tsarist era. We all know about Jews going to Israel. This actually picked up again in, in the late Soviet era in the 1980s. We all know, of course, about Jews going to America. Many millions of them did, uh, particularly in New York City, and in fact contributing vast amounts of interesting and strange things to American culture. My favorite is that most of the Christmas songs that Americans sing were actually written by Jewish composers, many of them of Russian descent. And then, of course, there was also this immigration to places like Germany. Germany being the homeland, the birthplace of international socialism, many Jews being socialist, it all kind of came together. Now, Zionism was different from socialism, of course. But the German idea was that in whatever form, socialism, Zionism, basically Jews agreed that Russia was sort of like the Antichrist. The Tsar was the greatest enemy of Jews in the world. And so Germany would support Zionism and socialism and Jews to destroy the Russian Empire. Um, it was the same sabotage bureau which cooked up the Zimmermann telegram. So these people were, shall we say, rather creative in their thinking. Now, the whole jihadi stratagem did not really pan out to much. They were expecting that there would be great Muslim uprisings in Egypt and India. That never really happened. The Zimmermann telegram, as we have seen, bore fruit directly with America's entry into war. The Zionist socialist stratagem actually bore, in some ways, even more explosive consequences. This is because, again, the Germans, it's a bit confusing. It's not that the February Revolution itself was cooked up by the Germans. There was a role, yes, the Germans were sending spies, espionage, literature, and money into Russia. However, it was what happened after the February Revolution, where the German stratagem really came into its own. The Germans had been supporting German socialists around Europe and around the world all through the war. They had been subsidizing Trotsky. Trotsky, it's a bit confusing. Um, the, the Russian Revolution is next week's subject, so don't worry about the details now. But Trotsky was then a Menshevik, not a Bolshevik. He and Lenin had not teamed up yet. Trotsky spent most of the war in Paris. Uh, he was also in New York City for a while, which in fact he kind of liked. In fact, when the February Revolution happened, Trotsky was in New York, and he was having such a good time, he actually at first did not want to leave. He really liked Manhattan, you know, he thought it was like modernity and skyscrapers and excitement, you know, it really, really turned him on. So Trotsky's on the German payroll. Lenin is on the German payroll. Basically, any Russian revolutionary socialist anti tsarist group in Europe was now being financed and subsidized by the Germans. They weren't all Jewish, but many of them were. So there was a blending together. The Germans are subsidizing Zionists, they're subsidizing socialists, and particularly they're subsidizing revolutionaries like Lenin. Lenin had been brought to Germany's attention um, by this character, I think I wrote his name somewhere here, Parvus. Uh, his, his actual uh, given name was Alexander Israel Helfant. But it's easier to remember him by Parvis. This was sort of like his code name. He was the agent, really one of the key figures of the 20th century, although not very well known to the general public. He was the agent who first brought Lenin to the attention of the German Foreign Office. And he did so, interestingly, in Istanbul, of all places. It was in Constantinople, as it was then called, that the idea of the Russian Revolution was actually born. Now, this is... Part of it is just accident. 
Parvis was a kind of savant. He was almost like a genius at kind of like a prophet at sniffing the winds. He had Originally, he was, of course, Jewish. He was from Odessa. He was a subject of the Tsar. Like a lot of these Jewish socialists, he had gone to Germany before the war. He had been a leading light in German socialism. He had then, after a while, decided the scene in Germany was a little stifling and boring for him. And so he decided right around 1910-11 to go to Turkey because he thought that's where the action was. So he got to Turkey just in time for the Tripoli War and the Balkan Wars, where he made a fortune in mysterious circumstances, possibly selling guns. He started a bunch of newspapers as one of those kind of brilliant, multilingual, uh, czarist Jewish intellectuals. He, of course, mastered Turkish. He actually began publishing articles in Turk Yurdu. Uh, he was close friends with Zia Gukalp and many of the other leading young Turk intellectuals. So he was like a man of all trades. By this point, he was independently wealthy. He got to pursue his own agendas. And he went to meet with the German ambassador, Hans von Wagenheim, in January of 1915. And that's when he said, you should put all of your weight behind Lenin. Now, in 1917, he basically said, look, forget about everybody else. Give all your money to Lenin, because Lenin is much more raving mad than all the other revolutionaries. What was his idea? His idea was this, again, Russia, the Tsar, greatest enemy of world Jewry. The Germans, even if he wasn't like a German militarist, the German military had the potential to destroy the Tsar and the Tsarist Empire. So therefore, the interests were identical. Revolutionierungspolitik. So the Germans literally took his advice. They took Lenin and all of his kind of closest comrades, um, including a uh, journalist called Karl Radek. Uh, again, I'll cover all of this in more detail next week when we look at the revolution itself. They put them on a train. Uh, the phrase you sometimes hear is a sealed train car, meaning it was like, sort of almost like locked in from the outside. That's not literally true. But if you think about geography, the idea kind of makes sense because Lenin was in Switzerland. They wanted him to get to Russia. But of course, in between Switzerland and Russia was the Eastern Front, basically. You know, millions of men, all heavily armed, barbed wire, etc. They can't send him across the front. So instead, they sent him straight through Germany. Now, the reason they said the car was sealed was because they realized it might not look good for Lenin politically in Russia if he were seen to be like a tool of the German military. And so they pretended like it was this extraterritorial train that would never even stop in Germany. Of course, that was rubbish. The whole thing was organized to the last detail by the German military. They sent him through Germany by way of Copenhagen and then Stockholm, which was set up. Sweden was essentially like the kind of ground zero for revolutionary conspira. Uh, back in Tsarist times, where all the smuggling routes went through. You know, smuggling in bombs, dynamite, literature, etc. The Germans set up a whole bureau in Stockholm, you know, a bunch of banks which they used to funnel money into Lenin inside Russia. And he arrives in Russia in April of 1917. And he has a very simple program. Eventually, they come up with this slogan, which you might have heard, peace, land, and bread. The key part of the slogan was, of course, peace. That is, Russia will surrender to Germany. That was pretty much the Bolshevik program. Um, now, it's not that it wasn't popular. There were a lot of people who did not want to keep fighting. But, of course, the idea of surrendering to Germany, that was Lenin's own idea. In fact, the other Bolsheviks at first did not like it. So, within a course of a couple of months in early 1917, we have, in essence, the outlines of the rest of the history of the 20th century. America's entry into World War I. America goes from essentially an isolated power, which pays very little attention to world politics, a backwater. You know, if you remember the, the, the embassy in Washington, like, ambassadors used to resign before they would get sent there. Oh, God, don't send me to Washington. Nothing happens there. It's a swamp. That was in the 19th century. As we know, in the 20th century, America became rather a big player in global affairs. All of that began with this. America goes from an army of 20,000, from a backwater, somewhat, again, self-righteous, but separate from the affairs of Europe. Suddenly, America has an army of 4 million men, and America is dictating policies to the world. All of this in the course of several months, which also brought about the February Revolution in Russia, 
and essentially the meltdown of the Russian armies on the Eastern Front. Such that by the end of 1917, largely due to Bolshevik subversion, there is no Russian army left. You have Russians at Rize, Trabzon, Erzijan, Bitlis, Van. Suddenly they're gone. They just vanish. Not all at once. I mean, it happened in stages, obviously. Lenin's decree of peace, land, and bread. Land, that was another key part of it. Land basically meant, hey, why don't you rush home and take some land for yourselves? The laws no longer exist. We are nationalizing everything. Get in while the getting is good. So all of these peasant soldiers decide, I don't want to be hanging out in, like, trap zone when back in Russia... I could be taking land from, you know, that aristocrat who used to oppress me, etc., etc. So they all rush home. They disappear. By early 1918, <laughs> the Turkish, basically the Ottoman Third Army, which had done nothing but lose since 1914, suddenly is faced with empty land. They just start moving forward. They reconquer not only all of these lands, but they also take Sarakamish, and they take Erzurum, and they take... Van, and they take Ardahan, and they take Batum, basically reversing the legacy of the, of the 1877 war. And by the end of 1918, they make it as far as Baku, because the Russian army disappeared. So again, there are these certain moments in world history, and this was definitely one of them. 1917. I haven't even gotten to the Balfour Declaration <laughs> and the creation eventually of the State of Israel, but that's a subject for another lecture. I think we're kind of towards the end of the first hour. Um, so I'm going to take a short break, and when we get back, we're going to take a closer look at American policy.